even exists. We're all going to pass from this earth and knowing what comes next can end the fear of death and bring you peace. Our goal here at Hello Heaven is to answer these questions and many more considering the afterlife. Welcome to our podcast, Hello Heaven. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hello Heaven. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be using my ability to channel with the spirits to bring you information about the afterlife. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. Barry and I have a long history of bringing you information about the afterlife in heaven. We currently have over 590 videos on our YouTube channel that brings you the videos to the paranormal and all of our podcasts and videos. It's in the name of Barry Strom. Now, hello, heaven. We broadcast on YouTube live. It's on my personal Facebook page and in our Facebook groups. One of our most active Facebook groups is Words of God Then and Now. And if you would like to join it, you can watch all of our live streams. Audios of our broadcasts can be downloaded on helloheaven.podbeam.com. That's helloheaven on podbean.com. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N. And it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google. Alexa, and many of the other audio platforms. We believe that our shows are truly unique and that we bring you information about the afterlife and have On Hello Heaven, we like to encourage listener participation through the use of video calls. If you'd like to participate in this program, just send an email to onestrom at gmail.com. Tell us about your questions, with whom you'd like to channel, and what you'd like to discuss. And Barry will get back to you with the time to make the recording. Okay, now this week, we're going to bring you a very interesting interview. We're going to be speaking with Scott Dagenhart. Uh, he will speak of a shared death experience, and he'll bring us some other supernatural events. And then we're going to talk a bit about EVPs. I don't know if you've ever spent any time listening to them, but you'll hear the actual words of a ghost speak to you. Uh, Scott's very good at it. He's specializing in it right now, so this will be a wonderful interview. Scott's appeared on Coast to Coast, Phil Donahue's show, and many other media outlets. One feature on Hello Heaven is we are going to try to bring you some of the most interesting guests that we can find. Today, our guest is Scott Degenhart. He's an author. He's expressed, he has experienced a, a shared death experience when his father passed. He's interviewed over 200 people that have had near death experiences. And Scott has also appeared on the Phil Donahue show, Coast to Coast, and many other radio and television shows. Among a bunch of other activities involving interactions with spirits, he's the host of EVP Diaries on YouTube. So, Scott. Welcome to Hello Heaven. Hi, Barry. How are you, how you doing and, today? I'm sorry, I forgot your wife's name. Connie. Connie. It's, Hi, Connie. And Barry. Con, <laughs> Connie is unforgettable. Once you know, <laughs> once you know her name the first time. Uh, we're going to be. We this year we are going to celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. Oh my God. God bless you. So, so believe me, to me, the name is unforgettable. <laughs> hey, Scott, we really appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, I was very impressed looking at all the things that you've done with your life and especially the supernatural part of it. So I'd love to hear you start telling me a little bit about yourself and your work and exactly what you're doing now. So, um, I'd like to say that I took the Forrest Gump approach in life, which is I just like grabbed every opportunity and window that opened up I, early on. I don't know. I always recognized never say no to an opportunity because you never know where to lead you. And yeah, sometimes it's straight over a cliff or into a brick wall. But for the most part, it ended up being a, a, an entirely new experience that was a, a tool yet in my knowledge throughout my lifetime, you know. 
And so I've ended up doing a lot of interesting things only because I tried them. And in most cases they worked, even though I never imagined they would. So I imagined something. It's the, the old thing about intent and law of attraction, I guess, is that you set an intent and then it shows up in your life and then boom, it happens. So uh, my life uh, apparently through this incarnation was destined to be down the spiritual path. Uh, in, in addition to extremely technical stuff I've done, I mean, I hold the world record in asteroid measurement. Um, I worked on Star Wars research uh, at universities. I mean, I've done some of the highest tech stuff there. It, you, when you talk about being around a, a rocket scientist, I literally worked on rockets, missiles, spacecraft. In addition to that, though, um, what I ignored a lot because it's very left brained was the right brain portion of my existence, which was the spirituality part of it. And, and the universe made sure that I couldn't ignore that by forcing it into my life repeatedly throughout my life. And only in my later years have I finally caught on that. Hey, you need that balance. You need to, you need to, you are, you're a spirit being having a human existence. <laughs> um, and that was showed to me early on and we'll get into it whenever you're ready. But that was shown to me early on when I experienced my father's passing firsthand. Uh, in other words, being there when he crossed over into the light and having no idea what that was or meant or anything. Um, I didn't invent it in my head because it was far beyond anything I ever imagined it at my uh, age of approximately 21, something like that. So. Um. Okay, Barry told me about your shared death experience, and I've been anxious to hear you tell us about it. Would you mind beginning with that story? Sure. So, what? So, let me first define what a shared death experience is. I mean, we've all heard Raymond Moody, of course, um, who I've met numerous times throughout, as you mentioned, the TV and radio stuff I've done. I've met Raymond numerous times and uh, worked. Uh, uh, an, a number of years with uh, what's called IANS, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. Uh, within that is where I learned the term, which I didn't even have a name for what my experience was, because it wasn't even thought about uh, until more people like me started to come forward with what's called a shared death experience. So in a near-death experience, you have someone who either comes very close to death or thinks they're going to die or does die, physically die and leave their body and then return to it with uh, a complete description of the afterworld, afterlife, other side. Uh, even some of them, even if they didn't go far, left their body, hovered above, watched everything, was able to come back and describe um, you know, one of the good examples that was used was a person that was in the hospital that um, went went out of their body while they were unconscious and or dead, went outside of the hospital and looked on a ledge and found a set of shoes sitting on a ledge out there, um, came back to their body and was able to describe to the nurses uh, about the shoe they saw. And because they're like, you could not have had any conscious uh, cognition because you were either dead or unconscious, whichever the case was. Well, the, the nurse ended up getting a maintenance worker to go out and look outside and found that shoe. And indeed with the laces even tucked in like the person described mm -hmm. out on a ledge. So that's an example kind of sort of, of a near death experience. In that case, the person is in extreme physical distress and or dead. In the, my case of a shared death experience, I experienced all those things and witnessed them firsthand, but I was not unhealthy. I wasn't near death. I wasn't sick. So my father was lying in a coma from terminal cancer, uh, St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm in Antioch, about 40-ish miles or so away. And the, the night had come where we knew it was a matter of hours, minutes. Uh, and because of the gru gru cruel nature of the cancer, um, as I went to bed this particular evening, the night he passed, 
um, it was running through my mind. Of course, when the call comes, I can't be surprised because we knew he was dying. Um, while sorrow is definitely uh, in my mind is like, oh, no, it's also relief because he's no longer suffering. So all these things are going through my mind as I'm falling asleep. Well, I'd finally fallen asleep for about an hour when I uh, abruptly woke up by this white uh, vapor misty spirit that came floating into my room. Now, I sat up and through things again back then, I had no name for any of this, but now I understand it's kind of telepathy. Uh, I was immediately my consciousness was connected to his consciousness and I immediately knew it was my dad. So it was the first thing, these are all the things I examined afterwards. Why wasn't I scared? A ghost walked into my room, you know, and the reason I wasn't scared is I immediately knew it was my dad through what I call, I guess, a spiritual name tag. I don't know. Somehow we emanate who we are. Right. Um, and I also felt I, there's no words to to do this other than the freshness of him having just left his physical body. Um, I knew he had just died. Um, I mean, I could, could like, I don't know how. Anyway, these are things like I could tell and I could tell how absolutely exuberant he was feeling having been freed from that sick body and also experiencing this new existence of spiritual unbounded existence although he hadn't quite caught on to that i don't think and the reason i say that when he appeared to me i only saw him from about the waist up he also appeared to me about 10 years younger he, he died when he was 45 but he looked to be in his 30s uh, he was very just fresh and i guess that was his, the age he wanted to be or remembered or whatever or felt um, so he uh, appeared in his 30s um, and, and but only from the waist up. And why that's significant is my dad was one of the few people that had polio um, and couldn't walk and learn how to walk through an experimental program in his uh, when he was very young. And uh, so I don't know. A lot of times they say people will carry into the after world their physical infirmities. And I don't know if that's why I only saw him from the waist up and not the waist down. But I've often thought about that. So he floats over to uh, the left side of my bed and immediately I'm feeling his excitement and I'm running through my head to ask questions, which is silly because I'm feeling the answers to them. And the very first question, which I've often said is the stupidest thing I ever asked is, how does it feel to be out of that pain racked body? And he just went exhilarating, you know, and which was, again, I was feeling it. So it was kind of an odd question. Um, as we were connecting and I'm like, okay, so wait a minute, I'm kind of trying to do logic in my head through the experience. I'm like, wait a minute, if I'm talking to him now and he's dead, how am I talking to him? And am I dead too? Because uh, like I didn't understand. And so when I looked down, when I was talking to him, I had actually half sat up out of my body so that from the waist down, I was in my body. From the waist up, I was out of my body. Well, then I held up my hand and I looked and I could see through it and I could see it as a white misty vapor energy, just like he was. And then I was like starting to get scared because again, I had, I didn't I make this whole thing up because I didn't even know what any of this was. It took me 15 years to even go back and reanalyze this experience. So I started to get scared, but then I, I calmed myself down because I said, wait, my dad is standing right here and this is going to be the last time I see him. I better reconnect and stick in the now and, and quit more. all this other stuff I said will somehow work itself out. Like, for instance, how am I going to get back in my body? That was my biggest fear. I'm like, I've popped out of my body now. If I'm not dead, how do I get back in my body? You know, and uh, 
So I re took my attention back to my dad and we were just sharing this wonderful love flow between the two of us. And then I started to notice as, as this was happening, this sort of light, which turned into a tunnel, which then kind of opened up, up in the upper right part of the ceiling. And uh, I kind of started drawing my attention over to it. And I noticed that when I say here, it wasn't with my my ears, but I could hear people milling about up there, like doing their thing in the afterworld. And I knew that that's what that was. I could tell that that was heaven. If you want to call it heaven, I'm just putting a label on it. Uh, that was the next place, heaven, the light, whatever you want to name, you want tag, you want to put on it. That was the hereafter. And, uh, I was trying to take my attention between the tunnel and my dad and the tunnel and my dad, because I was curious about that. I was every, all the stuff was just happening and, and it was fluid, very fluid uh, situation. And as the next time I looked up at the tunnel, there were two beings standing at the entrance to the tunnel. I now suspect it was probably probably one of my dad's guides and one of his um, uh, family members uh, from the other side. And I saw my dad. I didn't hear what they said, but I saw my dad look up at the tunnel and he looked back at me and he said, they're calling me now and I have to go. And and within that, also, since we're still in this telepathic thing, it was this whole sense and package of purpose of what he needed or had to do next. Like they gave him a glimpse of it and he was just like on it. He was just like, OK, I, I have to go now. And uh, as I've often look often look back at that experience, I didn't like reach out to grab. No, don't go, because I had the sense of what he relayed to me how important it was this next step. I was so excited for him. I was like, Oh, okay. You know, you go, you, you, you do, you go. And, um, he whooshed right up that tunnel and the two beings went with him, and then the tunnel just boom, slammed closed, was gone. Uh, then I amazingly without even trying and I don't even, know how I did it was back in my body and back asleep. Um, and the reason I know that was because about five minutes later, the phone rang and woke me up. <clears throat> now I was living with my mom at the time and my mom got to the phone first. Um, and she came to the door to my bedroom and said, that's the hospital calling to say that your dad just died. And I said, <laughs> I'm like, I know he was just here. And by the way, he's doing great. And we both looked at each other like, what did you just say? And I even looked at myself like, what did I just say? Um, for days after that experience, I had received some sort of spirit, uh, uh, spirit Red Bull. Uh, I was just so amped up. Um, and, and just all new senses and everything. When we went to the funeral home to view his body and I walked in, um, and I looked across the room, I l literally almost burst out laughing for the reason and I had to keep catch myself because I almost laughed because of how and I don't mean this for disrespect for anybody's lost family, but for how silly, I'll use the word silly, it, it looked to me that all these people were bent over the casket and were crying at this thing. And I, he's not there. <laughs> My dad has nothing to do with that anymore. He went that way, up that tunnel that I saw and is doing great. So I started to try and share this experience with family and and people around and it became apparent after a couple of days it was Im strongly impressed upon me 
to stop talking about it because they thought I had literally had a nervous breakdown and and was one signature away of signing a whatever it is, a 702 or whether it is to have me committed. Seriously, they were going to have me institutionalized if I didn't stop talking about it. And, and so I um, I'm like, I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to tell you all he's doing great. Uh, I saw it firsthand and but I didn't understand it. I had at that moment, this was 1982. There wasn't information out there. I had written it off as a glitch in the operating software of the universe that somehow allowed me to, to share his death. Well, um, one, one thing they all tell us is that the day that you pass is the best day of your life. <laughs> yeah. Because you're starting, best. you're starting a new life. Humans think, humans think that death is the end. Yeah. But when you know how it all works, you know that the day you pass is simply the beginning. It, Connie had a very similar thing. So, Connie? Uh, uh, mine wasn't quite as uh, amazing as yours, but it was, it was wonderful. Uh, yeah. The morning that we got the call from my sister that my dad had... Oh, we've lost audio. Connie, can't hear you. Can Is that you hear better? You? There you go. Uh, All right. Okay. I heard so, sister and then it went away. Okay. So was, well, we headed to my sister's house as soon as we found out that my dad had passed. And we weren't in the car for very long. And all of a sudden, my dad came through. To, his body was still laying up in my, my sister's house and warm. And he had already come to us because he had several things that he wanted us to take care of. So I thought that was kind of amazing. And like with you, I have never been sad about my father's passing because he spent the last two years of his life bedridden. And he wasn't the kind of person that liked to lay around and watch sports on TV and have a can of beer. He was <laughs> always out doing something. I mean, I remember one day I was up at his house and they lived on 12 acres of mountain land. And he was climbing up a ladder at the age of, I believe it was 91, to put some food out for the birds. So that laying on his back and having someone have to wait on him for two years was miserable for him. Right. So it's, <laughs> I shared a wonderful experience just like you did, and I'm happy for you. And also you had said about your dad looked younger. We've yeah. been told that once they pass over, they can make themselves look like they did, but it's usually like in their thirties. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what he did. He was, Oh, he, he was, uh, uh, you know, runs in our genes and I'll take, uh, pride in that and digging our genes are both handsome and smart people. And, um, <laughs> so, I'm not comment anything right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he, um, he, yeah, he was sharp. He was, uh, it was, it, it, the amazing thing was that I still go back to how did I not get scared at a ghost that walked into my room? <laughs> I mean, I had never had a ghost encounter my entire life. I like, I never even all that stuff. I was an atheist up until the age of 17. All right. I didn't even think there was anything period because I was so smart, uh, book smart that I had an answer for everything. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, That's right. Yeah. Common among the highly intelligent people. Yeah. We've so, interviewed several of them and the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can't prove it. It doesn't exist, but in this case it does. But why, why do you think some people have NDEs and other just go straight to heaven? That, so huh, what's interesting since I wrote what I like to call the owner's manual to the near death experience and how that all started. Just a brief summary on that was after my experience with my dad, I, I set out to understand what happened. And the best way I figured I could figure it out is to talk to people who had died. So uh, as there's no such thing as coincidences, uh, Demetria Kalademus, Channel 4 in Nashville, was starting a series on the near-death experience. Now, this is in the 90s now. So nine years had gone by, and uh, um, I, I'd given up talking about it, so I didn't get institutionalized. But I still had the curiosity. And when all that percolated back into society, then uh, um, I uh, I decided, OK, I had a real good angel author friend of mine, John Reiner's his name. And I sat down with John, told him my experience like I told you, only I took a whole hour 
expert to tell every minute detail in that experience. And um, at the end of the, that, I said, there you go, John, what do you think about that? And he goes, well, it's actually rather common. And I looked at him, you can bleep this out. I said, bullshit. I said, I've never once heard anybody talk about this. He goes, oh, well, talking about it's one thing. It happens. People just don't talk about it. I set out from there to set him wrong. And this is getting to your answer, Barry. Uh, I actually said, all right, I'm going to prove you wrong. So I went out and I started a support group for people who had come close to death or died and wanted to meet other people that had had the experience because what I found is people most times have no one to turn to and talk to. Um, and so I started up, call it a support group, but it really, it was a, a chat a means for people with NDEs to get together. What I learned was, in answer to your question, Barry, in the way that every one of us are unique. Take 10 of us, go to the state of Texas, come back and share our experiences. And we're all like, you couldn't have gone to Texas. I don't know what you're talking about. Every one of us will have 10 different impressions of Texas or whatever, whatever experience. In that same way, the experience after we leave our body is unique to that person. Um, it's unique to your existence only because it's interactive uh, in the fact that we create our next reality through the life experiences we've had. So what happens is some people, uh, when they leave their body, um, aren't ready to go oh yet through uh, addictions, unfinished business, um, care for loved ones. In the instance, for instance, moms with, with small children, they don't want to leave yet. So they will hang around what we call um, earthbound spirits. But at the same time, here's what we learn. Sometimes they do go to the light and say, I'm not ready to stay here. I need to go, go back. And I have those conversations literally on EVP recording that I'll tell you about of people who get to the, to the light, what I call the maitre d at the podium. They check in, uh, they go do a little bit of DR thing, I call it, and clean up, but then they say, I have to go back. I'm not done yet. We found on average that about three times people will come back um, to help their loved ones have, either have unfinished business or just want to be guardians for people. So, what we found, uh, what, what I don't like about uh, journalism and the, pr the uh, presentation of the near-death experience is number one, everybody's is different. The tunnel experience, which is the most prominent thing you see when you watch a TV show or a movie about someone who died, they go up a tunnel. While, yes, my dad had a tunnel. I saw it. It was the, call it the portal that went to the next world. Um, only 25% of people who die and come back experience a tunnel. Uh, some people just transition into the light without this structure tunnel. They just end up, in our case, we call it, we just go walk to the, our, our guides that in the particular thing I'm working on now, my current endeavor, we literally sometimes just walk people to the light. Um, and, uh, some people don't remember anything when they come back. About 25 or 30 percent of people who come back to their body remember black, nothing. It's like y'all are crazy when we talk about the near-death experiences. No, I didn't experience that at all. I'm like, well, that doesn't really mean anything. That just meant that at the moment, nothing happened for you that you came back with. There are times when even I have gone through the light and meditations and come back and they wouldn't let me take back whatever it was, experience I had. I've had it block, blocked out because I'm not meant to know that here because um, that's part of sort of this whole bigger <coughs> earth plan that you agreed to when you came here, you know. Well, so not right. every experience is right. to learn. Say again, Barry. No, I'm just saying that we're sent back to learn and they aren't going to tell you anything to, to shortcut it. Yeah, I can't tell you the number. I've recently got into Akashic Records now that I know we can access those because they want 
believe me, the other side's pulling for us. They want us to learn. They're around us, helping us all the mm -hmm. time. You are never alone, um, even when you die. So this is another thing I learned in the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. There's always what we what we termed a takeaway apparition. There's always a family member, friend, angel, spirit guide there with you. You never die alone. So if that's one comfort, we can tell everybody exactly. that nobody ever dies alone. Now, we repeatedly have channeled with Azrael, the angel that assists on passing. Oh, okay. I, and, I, um, I don't know all the angel names, I'll admit. I, I'm uh, That's a lot to know. <laughs> my, my last book is called uh, Messages of the Archangels. We nice. channeled 20 different archangels to write the book. Nice. So it's, um, but Azrael is the angel of death. And okay. he, he is saying exactly what you're saying, that there's always an angel present. Always. To help with the passing to make it more comfortable. I'm, and I'll take this one step further. And this is an upcoming episode. I'd hope it'd be nice if I had it ready now and we could have pre premiered it here. I took my digital recorder in with me. And actually, I, I recorded two. Use the voice recorder on this and the digital recorder when I had to, sadly but happily, euthanize my cat um, oh. about two months ago. Mm -hmm. I captured on EVP her telling me she would never for forget me, how much she loved me. And um, she told me when she stopped breathing. Um, and within that, there were six other beings there for her to take her even. Mm -hmm. So even she didn't die alone. Um, yeah. um, I talked with our cat on the other side. He, he had passed like 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. He was gone for about 10 years. And I asked him to come back. And he said, I'll return to you in 13 months as a black kitten. And I will find you. Within one week of when he told me he was coming back. This little black kitten found us, and it's in your the most life. miraculous story. So yeah, we we've done we do a fair amount of talk. Well, we have right that cat's still with us, the black one. Yeah, and he brought a tabby along, and the tabby turns out that the tabby was my daughter's dog in prior life. So nice. these are two from our animal soul family that we have here in the house right. now with us. <laughs> and there, you just used a key word that I wanted to bring up is soul family. Mm -hmm. And while in in our current uh, world, you think of your family as you know mother, father, daughter, grandmother, blah 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 blah. Those are actually tied, as you know, into a larger, probably million soul family who are all at sort of the same vibrational um uh level of enlightenment for lack of better terms um but that we work through the, so it's thing i inter interesting learned is that through marriage through jobs through other things we cross family streams in an effort to 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 grow and learn from other experiences but Recently, I started learning about hopping up that there and I've recognized now looking back, there have been people in my life that were from a different lower soul family that wanted to experience a higher soul family. Mm -hmm. So they came into my life and then they had the free will choice of staying on that path or returning to their uh, lower soul family. And in some cases, that's what they did. They just they couldn't take our level yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got to be prepared. But yes, yeah, so that even the animals are, are are weaved through our soul family. Oh, they're That's amazing. Crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, I talked with uh, the little black cat also wanted the same name, Bodacious. <laughs> and so, so Bodie is back, you know. Bodie is back. <laughs> That's nice. I was That's talking to Connie one time, and uh, I mean, I I hear all these conversations now with the animals and the souls. So. And Bodhi looks at me and she says, you know, I understand every word you're saying. <laughs> I, went, I didn't know that, Bodhi, <laughs> but we'll be more careful. And the next day she proved it to us because she hates having her claws pruned, <laughs> trimmed. And, and you said the words. Uh, yes. She was walking. We had a, an apartment at the time um, that <coughs> kind of go in a circle in because all the rooms were connected. And she came through the the den into the living room where Barry was sitting on the sofa 
And I walked in from the kitchen area and I says, Barry, we have got to trim their claws. And she stood up and looked at me and she ran back into our bedroom and went under the center of the bed. So that we could <laughs> So she truly does. They, they don't understand what you're saying. I, I've learned that through, and I still have a lot to learn about this experience with my cat's euthanasia because it only just happened a month and a half ago. And I began to learn from that by virtue of the fact I picked up on EVP human words that she was using to me meant she knew those words. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And while in some cases the sentences were kind of broken incomplete, but she sewed together words to make sentences that were words that I would have never even thought they would under, but that, yes, uh, Connie, an answer to that. They do know more than we think we, they know. <laughs> oh yeah. But the other week I was saying something to Barry and I said, these cats are so darn smart. And he heard Bodhi say, I'm smarter than, you know, <laughs> I'm smarter than, you know, <laughs> well, one, one of what I, one of the most, I mean, our cats have told us some amazing things, but but one of them that, that intrigued me in Bodhi's last life, when she accidentally snipped him a couple times, trimming these claws in that part of nails, yeah, right. So in this life, Bodhi is is scared to death of having her claws cut because of what right. happened prior. Exactly. But Leo is our is is our our tabby, and he was afraid of having these claws cut and i said leo why are you why are you afraid we've never hurt you and his answer was Bodie told me what she did in the past <laughs> <laughs> well, what <laughs> i mean it's it, apparently these animals have the ability to access the information on in those prior lives much well, easier than humans do yeah they probably don't have the same soul contract that we have with no, our guides of the limited pre-life knowledge so that it's what we call earth i call earth 101 is an accelerated learning session and the only way to do it is to come in scratch every time although we do have inherent tendencies from previous lifetimes that we don't understand and realize that we carried them over. It, it, so here's the way I see it. All right, so you'll you'll find a chapter in my book on reincarnation, what I call the circle of incarnation. We go through a lifetime, we pass. Uh, we go into the next world where we meet with our soul families and sit down and say, all right, I did good at this, I, I did bad at this. Next time around, I want you, 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 you to be this, 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 to facilitate this learning. Um, then, then we go to, I have met a person who went to the classroom in which they were taught, uh, the limitations they were going to have to endure on earth and accept those limitations. And then you were going to be born into that. And, um, I actually met someone who thought his whole life he was crazy. I was the only person he was ever able to share this with. And, uh, so then you're born into it. So. For about the first five to seven years, you actually still retain a lot of, even though it may be dreamlike in your head, uh, your memory, sort of memories that sort of guide your personality into the next, this current incarnation. And I think it's sort of like a compass pointer because you know how they say, that your per ninety percent of your personality is formed in the first uh, five years of your life. So I think that that particular uh, purpose of having a little bit of a, a remnant of your past lives, some kids remember them well because I've I've interviewed a few of them, and um, but it kind of points us in uh, where we need to go in this, this lifetime based on what we were and what was incomplete in the last lifetime, and then usually about the age of seven western society starts beating it out of you is the only way i can say it and then usually by about the time you hit uh 12 13 14 uh the hormones kick in and all that and most kids have lost their ability to see their imaginary friends the spirits to remember their past lives 
all that stuff in most cases, unless they retain it, um, lose it by about that age. So that's kind yeah, of the that, way I that's, see it. That's, a, that's exactly what we're being told also. So it's good stuff. Hey, yeah. you've the EVP thing. Yes. We have never played one for our listeners in all the shows yeah. that we've done. Do you, would it be possible for you to play one so that our listeners could actually hear what the spirit yeah. sounds like? I have queued up one of my uh, best ones, and I will. Uh, uh, this is literally <laughs> this cell phone right here. <laughs> I was on uh, the cell phone with one of our other medium team members about out to try and organize the next team session. Um, we work on um, cases. So, all right. Where the EVP diaries came from, came from the fact that we started helping, as we had already previously discussed, earthbound spirits who have unfinished business, who haven't gone to the light. What can we do to help them get where they belong at home back to the light? So we try and connect with them. We find out what they <clears throat> their unfinished business is and if it's safe legal and moral we will do everything within our power this right here isn't a wedding ring this is actually my commitment ring to the spirits we're working with that i will do everything as long as there's breath in my lungs to mm -hmm. to get them uh uh get their fin business finished so that they can cross over and we've helped does it actually we've helped over 300 now cross oh, over um most of those for children that's a whole nother episode we could do so we have team meetings regularly we're gonna, um, we're gonna have to do another episode in the future i can see it coming yeah <laughs> right <laughs> again forrest gump here <laughs> so many things that i've done most a lot of people are like no nah, you couldn't have done all that so where this evp so what happened was our team brings together every single tool they have clairvoyance, all the clairs, automatic writing, um, uh, dowsing rods, if need be, K2 meters, all the, I, I don't limit our ability to communicate to anything. So we have team meetings, we connect with the spirit we're working with. We find that if we focus so many uh, positive energies on one single spirit, the connection just is so clear. And then, um, we we uh, talk and work with them, but what happened is my remember back to my history. I'm a techie guy, so I said, "Hey, me being in broadcast, like I've got a lot of recording equipment, and I've seen on these ghost shows, you know, EVPs. You walk into a room, you ask a question, and you get an intelligent response on a simple meter." So I pulled it out one day and I asked an intelligent question, and immediately got a response and picked up a conversation of my spirit guide with another spirit guide uh, and the spirit we were working with, all of them collaborating on how I was gonna help. And now that I had made the free will choice to help them. So what happened was I ended up collecting millions of minutes of EVP communication with the, the other side. And part of what the spirits need is to be heard. They have something that needs to be said, even if it's just to be heard, to, to, to be able to let go. And uh, so I said, what am I going to do with these? So that's when we established the EVP diaries. Well, at that point, I started carrying this with me, like everywhere I go, including to my cat's euthanasia that I talked about. This particular EVP came from a time I was on that cell phone talking to a team member, and we were organizing the uh, next team meeting to meet with the the spirit we were working on at the time and you're going to hear the voice of the team leader jody who's in truth after we say the time you're going to hear her say i named the time and she goes perfect and um and i had the recorder going and i don't have the rest of it because it's too long but you lisa and i who are on the, who are on the phone go did you just hear that <laughs> yeah because it was a three-way phone call literally as clear as we're talking so i just wanted to set up what this is okay. and how uh oh all right now i'll play this okay. and you should be able to hear it corn button 
All right, y'all hang on a second. I'm going to play it to the phone. I have just Thank class, you so. for eight. That gives everybody a chance. Okay. Let's do it. 8 p.m. Girls, you hear that there, Team AL? 8 o'clock. Well, very nice. That sounds like a plan. So. Perfect. I have just class. That's a good one. So you heard the perfect, right? Yeah. yeah that's as loud as us on the phone. And Team AL, by the way, is the name I had to come uh, I felt. So I always liked it. That's why, Connie, I asked for your name. I feel one thing I find is that the respect of addressing people by name. And instead of just calling them spirits and ghosts and all that, I, I gave them a name of Team AL, which is our afterlife medium team. Um, and so I have a name for everything. But so that's when she's saying Team AL, uh, 8 p.m. And uh, uh, Jody, who's the head team person, goes, perfect. <laughs> yeah, we had I have a very interesting picture, photo that, that I've taken on the battlefield. I have a photograph of an angel lifting a soldier off the battlefield. Oh, man. And you can see the body of the soldier in its hands. As, and we've channeled spirits out on the battlefield that have not known they're, they're dead. Yes. The channel of the unknowing dead. Um, we have had some amazing occurrences speaking with them, but I think that on the battlefield, the angels, when they finally figured out, okay, guys, it's time to get your butt moving that they come out and help move the soldiers on because yes. I, I mean, the, the guys that I fought with out there, I said, why don't you guys move on? And he said, because those damn Yankees won't move on. They're still shooting at us. So, I mean, there's no time. So they're just, they're just kind of frozen in time out there. But it's amazing. We helped clear a 300-year-old cemetery, Halkin Cemetery in North Wales. And uh, there were 300, approximately 300 spirits, roughly, trapped there because of the religious beliefs of the grown-ups because most of them were children uh halkin was an exception it was a lead mining uh, area back in the 1700s for england and uh so people didn't live long because they died from lead poisoning and then the horrible diseases and famine and all that so the majority of the deaths out there were like kids um and but there were there was a church there and what happened was when everybody passed as sort of protectors of the souls they would huddle the kids with them and wouldn't let them go to the light because they didn't know what it was and didn't understand it mm -hmm. they thought it was a trick literally they told us no that's a trick we we had to work with them for a couple of months to get them to understand and then at one point we had a mass 300 soul crossing that was spectacular um but why don't people cross over there's so many different reasons it gets back to all the different reasons there are people who don't know they're dead literally yeah. if their death was so instantaneous in a traumatic event there's a lot of times next thing you know it's like why can't anybody hear me why is everybody ignoring me um yeah no we've had we've had all those experiences and, and back to nobody being alone, just like you said, Barry, there are spirits that are constantly there working like, OK, come on. That's all right. OK, come on. Let's go. Even in the case of suicides where someone gets stuck in uh, in the loop of what they did and just can't break free and can't move on. There are we find that there are spirits, family, friends, guides standing there like. It's okay. All right, come on. It's okay. And working constantly with them to in, to bring their energy level up enough to move on. Uh, but there is a point, like you said, where they finally just say, all right, we're going to scoop you up. And that's, nobody ever gets left behind. Um, no, it's, ever. Just, it's just a matter of when. Yes. Of and when, as you said, there doesn't seem to be a time over there. These people who had been there for 300 years, all they understood was, well, yeah, things seem to be a little different and nobody's paying them any attention, but they were still trapped in that cemetery, you know. That's in, in that dimension of heaven. There's no time. That's how it's the way it works. How do you defend yourself against evil when you're opening all these uh, pathways? 
That is a very good question and something <laughs> early on why I didn't uh, sort of explore my uh, spiritual and or psychic abilities early on was not understanding it for the reasons of that, uh, because, you know, I grew up with the show Amityville Horror. All right. So mm -hmm. I've seen how bad it can get. And um, what uh I've had classes now with some of our medium classes about spiritual safety, but for the most part, I rely on my, my guides and uh, my team family. And, and so now with team AL, we actually have a couple of people who are our team AL security and we've had to call them in occasionally to haul people off all bad spirits off who tried to in infiltrate some of the stuff we were doing. Um, and so it's a matter of keeping a stronger white light presence so that the negative darker energies don't even want to go near it in the first place, but it is a constant effort of maintaining that understanding, um, and still constantly going back and doing clearings, you know, making sure portals that we opened up are shut down. Yeah. The one uh, who we started channeling and truly opening those channels. The guides actually gave us a prayer, a prayer of protection to use. There you go. Yeah. When we were using a channeling board, we actually had the prayer taped to the back of the channeling board. As they told <laughs> us to do it. Yeah. But any of our shows, um, our channeling history shows, Connie always says the prayer of protection on the show because we're the whole show is dedicated to opening channels and speaking to spirits. So right. That's how we do it. But we just we just trust our faith in the big guy and yes, it worked out pretty well. Yes. No, but you, you have to understand that because there are people that take things home with them or oh, yeah. uh, or, or whatever that um, don't understand that. And we've had a few that have come to, to be, like come into one of our uh, living that have come into one of our sessions that had an attachment, a really bad one. And we've, we have literally had one of them hauled away and cuffs cuffed to his hands and let shackled. That's the word I'm trying drug off by security because he got in and he would went to every one of our team members and just started crap and would get this person mad at that person and was trying to disrupt everything we were doing by just subtle stuff. It wasn't even, obvious stuff and i'm like i'm listening to my avps i'm like why is everybody fighting on the other side well then we heard the name of the person mm -hmm. who had recently passed and this person was a troublemaker in real life so all he did was he carried it into the Very other right. side and then turned out one of our living people happened to be a family member of this so that's why he came to us you know yeah. because he but we had him hauled off we had him put in prison <laughs> well Scott, we're going to have to do this again. Okay. Um, I'm kind of, I got another call I got to make here in a little bit. Gotcha. Why don't, yeah. why don't you take a couple minutes and tell our listeners how they can, can contact you, how they can get in touch and whatever you okay. want to say you're on. All right. So um, early on when we talked about what I call the owner's manual to the near death experience, that uh, book is actually the second edition is available on Kindle on Amazon. Uh, um uh, surviving death again. It was the first one was called surviving death. I called the second one edition surviving death again, because the key was on reincarnation. So there's a play on reincarnation. Oh. Find that on Amazon, uh, on YouTube of all these wonderful EVPs that we're putting up the voices from the other side, uh, is, uh, the EVP diaries on YouTube. We have a website, EVP diaries, uh, dot com and uh, that's where you can kind of see some of the cases There's a lot of stuff we can't put up yet because law enforcement case is still pending we can't really put everything out there but we we like to try and keep a, a presence out there and um, best we can and uh, if they want to email me it's the evp diaries at gmail.com um, those are some of the best quickest ways to find what we're doing okay well i promise you that we are going to be back again and uh yeah the buttons will work again and we'll click them again and uh, uh, 
<laughs> hey, I, I made everything work this time. Yeah. Against all odds. So, well, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Connie and Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Scott, we'll and, talk again. And thank you for sharing uh, about your dad. It's always a uh, uh, priceless, heartfelt thing. Yes. Okay. It's, it's amazing. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Night. Okay, everybody. That was, uh, I thought that was an incredible interview. We thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, Scott, thank you. We will be definitely doing this one more time. EVPs are very interesting. We'll have to do a show on them one of these days in the future. I have a couple that I've recorded in the past, and they're very interesting when you hear it go speak with you. Now, now you can download the interview that we just did at helloheaven.podbean.com. I am amazed at how many of our listeners have had supernatural encounters with the other side. Next week, we will be bringing you two listener interviews. In one interview, we will learn about a miracle healing. And in the second segment, our listener will tell us about an event where an angel took human form and gave her advice to get her through a tough period. It involved music, so we'll be channeling with Archangel of Music, Sandolphin, and ask her questions about the happening. Now, my 10th book, Modern Messages of the Archangels, is now available for purchase. The book can be purchased in a, as an audiobook, paperback, hardcover, <clears throat> or an ebook on Amazon. If you want a signed copy, go to my website. It's barrystrom.com. Now, during the past several years, Connie and I have channeled over 20 different archangels. And in this book, we bring you their messages. It's a great book. It can bring a lot of peace to many people. I suggest that it makes a great gift for somebody that's having problems. But then a bit, I am just a little bit biased in my opinion. <laughs> now, all 10 of my books are available on Amazon or the website, barrystrom.com. The subject matter in my books ranges from the ghosts on the battlefield of Gettysburg to afterlife, aliens, conspiracies. One book tells the life of Jesus. And we have a book on the messages of God and a book on the messages of archangels. So check them out. I think that they will definitely improve your life. And I'd like to thank Scott for being on our show tonight. And thank you for listening to our podcast, Hello Heaven. Please tell your friends about our shows. They're all meant to prove the existence of the afterlife and improve your life. If you'd like to see videos as you listen, Please join us on YouTube Live or Facebook Live on Barry's personal page and in our Facebook groups on Fridays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. The audio of our shows can be heard on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Alexa, Spotify, iHeart, and all the major platforms. So thank you for listening to Hello Heaven. Our show's new and we hope you're enjoying it. We'll be posting the podcast on our live streaming channels and all of our audio platforms at 6 p.m. 6 Pacific time on Fridays. Please tell your friends about our show. Goodbye, and thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you for listening to Hello Heaven. Please join us Fridays at 6 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube and Facebook. You can hear us on multiple audio platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Alexa, and other media platforms as well. If you'd like to appear on the show, send an email to onestrom at gmail.com and tell us your story. Have a great week. Tell your friends about our show. They'll thank you for it. Music is by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com. <laughs>